Okay, thanks Liz. Um, thank you all for inviting me here today. Um, it's great to be here in Liverpool. It's uh, somewhat colder than it was in Belfast this morning, but um, uh, hopefully you'll enjoy the talk here today. Okay, so uh, as Liz mentioned, I'm project director for Integrated Care Partnerships in Northern Ireland. So ICPs, as we refer to them, are a key element of the wider Transforming Your Care program within Northern Ireland. We see the reform agenda very much as evolution as opposed to revolution. Uh, we've been about 18 months into what I would describe as a five-month journey, and it hasn't been easy. But it is beginning to bear fruit. I can't address the full spectrum of our work within Northern Ireland today, so I would very much encourage you to have a look at the board website and follow the pages to Transforming Your Care to get a flavour of the much wider piece of work that we're progressing. Um, we do a lot of things amazingly well, and we could do a lot of things an awful lot better, particularly in terms of joined up care for people with complex health needs. And that's where ICPs come in. We look to improve the patient's pathway through the health and care system. So what is an ICP? Well, essentially, it's a network of providers designed to bring together clinicians, other healthcare professionals, the community sector, service users and carers to review current service provision, what's working well in the pathway, what isn't, and how it can be improved. There are 17 ICPs across Northern Ireland. I've shown a portion here attributable to the southeastern area. There are four ICPs. Each ICP has a partnership committee comprising of 13 individuals. There are two GPs, two community pharmacists, a hospital consultant, social worker, a nurse, allied health professional, an ambulance representative, and a representative from the voluntary sector, a representative from the community sector, and most importantly, a service user and a carer. ICPs are supported by what we describe as a clinical and business support team, and there are five of those across Northern Ireland reflecting our five local commissioning group boundaries. There are a part-time GP, a business manager, and two support staff. ICPs have been asked through departmental policy that was developed in June 2013 to look at five clinical priority areas in Northern Ireland. Frail elderly, respiratory, end of life care, diabetes, and stroke. We refer to these under the acronym of FREDS. Each ICP operates under a memorandum of understanding. Each has a local accountability agreement with their local commissioning group. And we've put in place regular meetings and discussions, and that's central to progress between the ICP and the relevant commissioning group. We've developed a short animation to try and convey the idea behind ICPs and the type of work we're progressing. Um, I'll, I'll have a go at playing it now. Hopefully the technology's working at this end. If not, bear with me. short and sweet, and hopefully you enjoyed that. As I say, uh, you will find the, the animation itself uh, on the, the department or the board website. Okay, um, this next slide I've put up just to give you a bit of a flavor. I'm not sure how familiar you would be with the structures of healthcare in Northern Ireland. They are slightly different to England. Um, as you can see, we have a Minister of Health, Jim Wells, at the department, which sets regional policy. Um, we have then a regional health board and five local commissioning groups which are essentially subcommittees of that board and they're tasked with um, providing regional commissioning direction. The local commissioning groups then would take that regional direction and apply a local flavour to it if you like. We also have a public health agency whose role involves public health, health promotion, quality and safety and they also house our centre for connected health 
uh, which looks at the promotion of improvements in patient care through innovation and the use of technology, and I'm sure uh, some of you in the room will be very familiar with them and their work. We then have five integrated health and social care trusts, and um, I would have to use that phrase integrated quite loosely. I, I have to confess, um, whilst we are very much integrated in terms of acute and community trusts, at times they don't operate that way, and certainly as Bledon was alluding to earlier, the financial incentives in particular aren't aligned to allow that, and I'll maybe touch a little on that later. We also have one regional ambulance trust, Northern Ireland Ambulance Service. Add to that then 351 GP practices, all of the other providers in the system, the third sector and the independent sector, a population of about 1.8 million people, and a budget of over 4 billion. Um, you can see why it's complex and difficult to navigate. You're probably saying with a population of that size it shouldn't be, and it shouldn't be but it is, and it's especially difficult to navigate for the patient. So, as I say, we refer to it as the RICE agenda. Uh, risk stratification, information sharing, care planning, and evaluation. And this is the, the key themes that we've asked each ICP to have a look at. Um, I should have mentioned that in terms of the structure of what ICPs are doing, um, regional commissioning direction is set by the board, we then have asked the ICPs to take it, run with it, and look at some pieces of pathway work, and I'll come on to that shortly. But in terms of risk stratification, essentially that's how we can identify those most at risk of hospital admission or deterioration and better join up their care. In terms of information sharing, how can we share information much better across the system to deliver better and more joined up care? From a care pathways perspective then, how can we look at the entire care pathway? And that's through from the healthy citizen through to, you know, from prevention through the end of life care and make it more patient centered and integrated. Evaluation then, how can we ensure a robust approach to measuring and evaluating services? In terms of risk stratification, just to touch briefly on it, um, we've developed a primary care feed, pseudonymized at source and extracted using MyQuest from GP clinical systems. Um, we're running a GMS, a local enhanced service, for those of you that know or are familiar with the GP contract, that's a mechanism whereby we can pay GP practices to deliver enhanced care. I think um, there are similar type of schemes running uh, in England here through the directed enhanced services that you would have. We're also then encouraging the GPs and most importantly the ICP to proactively manage those patients that are identified at highest risk. Ensure that they're on the appropriate care pathway and continually review and follow up care through multidisciplinary group meetings. I'll talk um, about the care pathway piece later, but maybe just to pick up on uh, a couple of points that Bledon raised there. In particular, um, I'd like to emphasize the importance of leadership and leadership locally within the ICP. Um, we ran an ICP clinical leadership program, and we launched it in September 2013 through the HSC Leadership Center and also Karen Picking Associates, um, who you may be familiar with. Its aim was to develop senior leadership capability and capacity within ICPs, and we've put through approximately 50 participants uh, coming from a GP community pharmacy and hospital consultant background. In conjunction with that, we've also run uh, a series of organizational development and other leadership programs for the entire members of the ICP. We've looked at uh, bespoke service user and carer training and development, trying to promote them and their role and give them the confidence to take forward the service user and carer agenda within that ICP partnership committee. The strong leadership is absolutely central to integration and to reform, and uh, you know I can't emphasize that enough, I'd have to say at this juncture. Okay. Um, Pathway work then, this is a very simple slide, if you like, a much simpler version than, than many I've seen. But this essentially is the type of nature of work that we're looking at. You know, we're looking at stroke care from the citizen 
then becoming a patient, the various mechanisms by which that person then can then present into the healthcare system. As I say, it should be simple, it should be relatively straightforward, it should be known to all of the providers and to the patient, but it's not. Down at the bottom there, I've just uh, put up the, for those of you familiar with it, the IHI notion of pick an important problem and fix it. And again, that's central to our philosophy and it's central to what we're trying to do. We've also started working recently uh, in service improvement methodology. I'm not sure, again, whether any of you are familiar with the work of Simon Dodds, uh, saasoft.com. Again, maybe that's something you would... Uh, I could recommend to you, but he has a program, Foundation of Improvement Service in Healthcare, the FACE program. If you go online, have a look, there's a, a very useful module that he runs called Save the Health Service, I think it is, or Save the NHS. It's a, uh, a bit of a computer game, if you like, so it should appeal to you out there. But again, exceptionally simple, but very, very powerful. It's just a slide of some of our multidisciplinary teams looking at some of the pathway work, again, um, thrashing out the issues and the problems. Some are high tech, some aren't, as you can see. Uh, as I said, we certainly weren't trying to be prescriptive in terms of a methodology or an approach. We have provided the teams with best practice and evidence and training on service improvement methodologies. You know, we've looked at Lean, Six Sigma, all of those things, but at the end of the day, it's the professionals and the service users in the room that can actually convey to you exactly what the pathway is at present. We know what it should look like and we know what good care and joined up care should look like, or we like to think we do. But that isn't the case, let me assure you, when you get uh, professionals, clinicians, and in particular, those service users and carers in the room, and they're a hugely powerful voice. Key measures of success then, um, nothing new up there. But as with all things, measurement is absolutely essential. Um, one of the problems we face, certainly within the ICP element of transforming your care in Northern Ireland is how do you disaggregate and attribute the success of a program like ICPs, uh, you know, distill it out from the wider reform and that's a challenge we're continuing to work with. Um, I'm sure it's the same here in England. Our department uh, in Belfast love to count and love to measure things. Um, commissioning teams as well love to count and love to measure things. Uh, unfortunately, they don't always count what matters and uh, the things that do matter aren't particularly easy to count. There's a lot of data in the health system, but very little information. After much debate, however, we have a greater suite of metrics and certainly I can provide uh, them to anyone who's particularly interested. I'll not, I'll not dwell on that today. We have made tremendous steps forward. Uh, you know, we have fully mapped out pathways in each of our 17 ICP areas. Um, some of that work has required funding, some hasn't. We don't have a, a better care fund, if you like, as you do in England here. Uh, we were promised some money, and then with the budgetary issues in Northern Ireland, it was very quickly taken away from us. So um, that has been a challenge. And the business planning process itself has been a huge challenge. The notion of invest to save very quickly became save to invest. And to an extent, that process and the issues around contracting and payment have very much hijacked. Uh, some are of, a, are of our initial progress, if you like, but um, we're working our way through that. I'll just very briefly put up some of the examples of service changes included. I've, I've listed here some of the pieces of work from the frail elderly side of the house, none of which will be a surprise to you. You know, we're looking at things like virtual wards, as I mentioned, proactive management. We've unashamedly nicked best practice from uh, England from Europe and from around the world. You know, we have very close working relationships with New Zealand in particular, whose locality care partnerships uh, are very similar to the type and nature of work that we're trying to progress here today. 
I would have to say, though, that 80% and, you know, at least 80% of everything that we've achieved to date is premised in and around communication. It's all about getting the right people in the room. It's absolutely amazing to sit in a room and, you know, as, as Bledon referred to earlier on, I think, you know, to see hospital consultants, social care workers and GPs in the room communicating around real issues for the first time in a very long time, you know, it, it warms the heart, I have to say that. So in terms of what's working well and what are the challenges, I think Bledon alluded to quite a few of them earlier, so I'll not repeat them, but um, integrating care is, is very difficult and it's complex, but it's achievable. You know, the complexity really is in the way that the care system is designed and it's designed around professionals as opposed to the patient. So we need to change that. And that uh, is hugely challenging in particular to the professionals involved. You know, it's, there's a lack of ownership of the problem. There's definitely been a historic lack of involvement of users and carers in their own care. There's poor communication, duplication and tasks, duplications in payment, duplication and in incentives, and very much perverse incentives. Um, ultimately, the success and the success to date of ICPs has been dependent on people and their ability to lead, their ability to make arrangements and find accommodations, recognizing the needs of the other sectors, but very much keeping the patient and the client at the heart of everything they do. Uh, Bledon referred to earlier on, uh, you know, in terms of a conversation on incentivizing change. There's a lot that ICPs have been able to do through quite simply working together in the communication side, but, you know, there isn't an alignment of incentives, certainly there isn't an alignment of incentives in Northern Ireland. Uh, you know, the, the separation of the budgetary systems, separate payment pathways in particular to the trusts and GP practices are a real issue for us in Northern Ireland. And I know that um, some of the CCGs here and Bledon referred to some of them earlier have been making real progress with regard to lands contracting and the prime contractor models, etc. And that would be something that we'd be very keen to explore. Um, it would be remiss of me to come to uh, an ECH uh, alliance meeting and not talk about the e-health agenda. Um, it's not overly my area of expertise, I have to confess, but certainly uh, we're looking at best practice, as you know, Brian O'Connor is particularly active in Northern Ireland and the ECH alliance in driving innovation and looking at how technology can drive innovation and we're very keen to embrace that. Maybe just highlight a couple of pieces of work that ICPs are directly involved in. Uh, one of them would be the Beyond Silos project, and this is a, a project that we've secured European funding for. It essentially is aimed at the further development of our award-winning electronic care record, and I'm sure some of you will be familiar with that piece of work. But what we're trying to do with that is to evolve it into a shared care plan tool. Um, which will look at real-time patient-centered personal plan, linking all of the services and allowing all of the providers involved in that person's care and also the patient the opportunity to look at where they are within that pathway. Essentially, I sort of describe it as moving from the noun of a care plan or a paper-based document, if you like, to the verb of care planning, the actual doing piece. Another bit I'd like to flag to you, and I'm not sure whether you're familiar or not with it, would be Project ECHO. And again, that's building on the work of uh, a Dr. Sanjeev Aurora in New Mexico. Um, we're currently using the ECHO model to look at hospice care in Northern Ireland we, with a view to rolling it out in other consultant-led models of care, particularly diabetes and cardiology. Essentially, it uses the upskilling of community clinicians by consultants through tele and video conferencing, internet-based assessment tools and online presentations, etc. As I say, if you, if you want to Google it, Project Echo, it's taking America by storm and 
certainly we have been very impressed with it. Um, just to finish off then, I think this slide says it all. You know, what people think success looks like and what it really looks like. You know, improvement is exceptionally difficult and real partnership working is exceptionally difficult. The trust required and the time involved to build that trust can't be underestimated. You know, so don't, don't think it will happen overnight. Getting people in a room is very much just the start. You need to, to invest the time, the trust, the honesty, the open and frank conversations and the very difficult conversations. You know, I, I've been in rooms and topics have been discussed very, very hard for people to, to hear and listen. Um, but it, it happens and you know, it's exceptionally good. You know, the improvement methodologies and techniques we refer to, you know, PDSA cycles, process mapping, all of those things, they all have a place. But really what's needed is the soft skills of leadership, you know, conflict management, assertiveness, negotiation, political skills, and understanding of your local health economy, starting with the end in mind and knowing where you want to go to. Uh, it doesn't lend itself particularly well to time skills and project management and, you know, the Prince practitioners amongst you would have a bit of a nightmare with this type of process, I have to confess, being one myself, but, um, you know, it, it is a huge challenge. Uh, our ICP members refer to it at times as being asked to, to play a new game, but to the old rules. Uh, one of them described recently to me, you know, to quote him, you know, we're, we're being asked to play Monopoly, we're being given the rules of Cluedo, and if we're not careful, we'll all end up playing Snap. So, we've been hugely successful in this first year, but as I say, it's, it's very much first steps. It is a huge challenge. I would see it very much as a five or a ten year process. It's a journey, but I think definitely integrated care is the way to go. I've been working in the health service in Northern Ireland for over 25 years. I've held a, a variety of positions coming first from finance through to IT. I've been working in the primary care side now for about 15 years. I've been working very, very closely with patients and service users. I've seen the challenges in the system and I'm very well aware of the challenges in the system. And to me, this solution is the only solution. Okay, thank you very much. Okay.